lot of work getting ready here. <laughs> so, good morning, everyone. Good morning. And welcome this beautiful day with Quimper Unitarian Universal Fellowship. Whoever you are, and wherever you're from, whoever you love, and whatever your faith tradition, you are welcome here. My name is Kate Kinney, and I minister here at QUUF. Jean Wallet will serve as worship assistant. I'd like to begin this service by acknowledging that the water, land, and shorelines here in Port Townsend are the traditional territory of, of the Skellum and Chimicum peoples. We honor and acknowledge our indigenous members and neighbors and vow to restore and sustain their homelands. And as we call in our time together, let us settle our minds and calm our hearts with the ringing of the chime. Again, it's good to be together. I'd like to welcome Katie Taylor, who will sing a special call to community today. And it is called Thanks to, Th to Thee. And the text is from the Carmina Galdec Galdecia, I think it's called, with the music by Katie. Thanks to thee, O oh God, that I have risen today, and to the rising of life itself. May it be to thine own glory, O oh God of every gift, and to the glory of my soul likewise. I ask of thee, O oh God, that thou my soul shall aid with the aiding of thy mercy. Even as I clothe my body with wool, O oh God of every gift, cover my soul with the shadow of thy wing. I ask of thee, O oh God, that thou my life from ill shield and the source of every ill forsake. Even as the mist scatters on the hill, O oh God of every gift, may each ill haze clear from my soul likewise. Thanks to thee, O oh God, that I have risen today. Thank you, Katie. That was just beautiful. Thank you. Please join me now in our chalice lighting words. We light this chalice with thanksgiving for all creation, for our lives, our joys, and our blessings, and we give thanks for our journey. Katie and Pat will now lead us in our opening hymn, number 349, We Gather Together. Please stand as you are.
Our opening words are from David Stendorast. When I am grateful, I am neither rushing nor slouching through my day. I'm dancing. Our response of reading is from Eugene Pickett. We give thanks this day for the expanding grandeur of creation worlds, known and unknown, galaxies beyond galaxies, filling us with awe and challenging our imaginations. For this fragile planet Earth, its times and tides, its sunsets and seasons. For the joy of human life, its wonders and surprises, its hopes and achievements. For our human community, our common past and future hope, our oneness transcending all separation, our capacity for working for peace and justice in the midst of hostility and oppression. For high hopes and noble causes, for faith without fanaticism, for understanding of views not shared. For all who have labored and suffered for a fair world, who have lived so that others might live in dignity and freedom. For human liberty and sacred rights, for opportunities to change and grow, to affirm and choose. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'd now like to welcome Bo Olgren, our Director of Family Ministries. Bo. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Today in RE, our littles are going to be continuing our exploration of our senses, looking at our sense of sight. Uh, our middle elementary group is going to be working on our potions class, as well as celebrating our successful contribution to working towards hunger against our hunger horcrux. Uh, because as a community, as an interfaith community, we raised over $27,000 and over 1,000 pounds of food just this last month. Just a few months. And then our middle school group has a pagan guest speaker coming today in our continuation of religious experience. So will those of you now on our aisle please stand as you're willing or able to form an arch for our children and we will sing them out. Go now in peace, go now in peace. Thank you, Bo, and good morning, everyone. What we'd like to do now is acknowledge and welcome those of you who are visiting us for the first or second time. If you are online with us, you are invited to say hello in the chat section and tell us your name and where you're from. Uh, the chat can be found below or on the right side of the video when it is out of full screen mode. And if you're attending in person, uh, please rise as you are able or raise your hand so that we may welcome you. Welcome. Welcome everyone and we're glad that you are with us today. 
And we will now receive the offering, which today goes to support our programming, staff, and the building here at QUUF. If you'd like to donate to this worthy cause, you have a few options. First, the ushers will be coming among you and receiving the offering for those of you here in person. For those viewing online, please text the amount you'd like to give to the number that's now showing at the bottom of the screen. Or go to our website, quuf.org, and click on the giving link. Or simply mail a check to QUF. Just remember to put offering in the memo line. We will now gratefully receive your offering as we listen to Katie and Ida perform a traditional English tune, None Such. She will bring the buds of spring and laugh among the flowers. In summer's heat, her kisses are sweet. She sings in leafy bowers. She cuts the cane and gathers the grain when leaves are fall surround her. Her bones grow. Thank you, Katie and Ida. Katie, I don't know how you got your mouth around those words. <laughs> well, for many years now, we at QUUF have provided meals to the Coast Winter Shelter. This is the primary social justice activity for the year. Our first week is the week after Thanksgiving, December 28th, 
Yeah, it says December 28th to December 2nd. I think it's supposed to be November 28th. <laughs> the teams are set to provide the meals, but we still need volunteers to make baked goods for the shelter. And baked goods serve as our desserts and leftovers and are added to the lunches for the next day. And baked goods include things like brownies, sweetbreads, or cookies. Sounds good to me. If you're able to contribute, please contact Diane Haas or Kathleen Holt. And phone numbers and email addresses are in the update or in the directory. I'd now like to welcome Hillary Rosen with some information from the Healing Community team. Hillary. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Hillary Rosen, and I'm with the Healthy Community team. And we are hosting a bunch of conversation cafes after the service. So we'll give everybody a couple of minutes to chat and and get your coffee, and then our thought is we'll ring a bell, and if you're interested in, we'll have one question about the service, and then we'll also have a question, remember the cottage meetings that we've had, a lot of those, a lot of those things that we wanted to talk about, the things that we care about deeply. So there's one question from the cottage meetings, and then one question from the service. And we just get together, and talk, and be, be together. So you're welcome, and if you, when you hear the bell, we're over in the den over there, so thanks. Thanks, Hillary. And so, you know, has anybody heard anything from Teddy Fernandez lately, you know? I mean, yeah, he, he had a big moment. I, you know, I saw him in the back, and he was really doing his thing. Oh, he's still around, everybody. So, you still have a voice, Teddy? I'm still around. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. As you well know, I'm Teddy Fernandez. Are you like me, unbearably excited about our wonderful teddy bear picnic auction that happened on Friday? I certainly hope so. I have an amazing story, and I even have permission to tell it this time. On Friday night at the auction event, I asked Joseph Bernarek, our fund and need auctioneer, and a poetry expert to help me dig deeper into a poem I've been wrestling with since I was a cub. <laughs> it's a classic, you all know it. It's called Fuzzy Wuzzy. <laughs> Joseph was able to help me, but wait till you hear this. After the program, our, the Reverend Bruce Bodie, our minister emeritus, told Joseph and me about his first poem. He said he was only five years old. He hadn't even learned to write but his mother taught him the poem Fuzzy Wuzzy. He then recited it for the whole class. Bruce said it overwhelmed the teacher, and it's his only memory of kindergarten. <laughs> it's barely believable, but true. But back to the auction. What a grand event it was. The music, the premiere of our epic teddy bear picnic slideshow. Raffle baskets, the fun to need, delicious light bites, s'mores, friends, fun and fellowship. And we had stellar weather for the bonfires. Who could ask for anything more? What did the fund and need raise for our financial services? And what did it bring to bear, you ask? Our goal is 29K, and so far we've raised almost $19,700. Yeah, applause for that, sure. I also want to tell you how our auction is doing. I also want to tell you how our auction is doing. Our auction is by far our biggest fundraiser. Our goal this year is $30,000. At this moment, as of this moment, as of this morning, we've raised just over $20,000. So we want to thank everyone who worked on the auction and contributed to the auction and fund in need. But wait, I just said contributed in the past tense. The auction does, doesn't end this afternoon until 5 p.m. That's this afternoon at 5 p.m. Goldilocks, you know, had three bears visit her house. And we have three ways we can support the auction. One, you can bid on items. 
Two, you can donate to the fund in need and funds will go into the financial reserve fund. Or three, you can make a donation directly to our auction during the checkout process. Supporting the auction supports QUUF, our beloved community, and all those things that we achieve here. We want QUUF to thrive. Now on to housekeeping. On Monday or soon thereafter, you'll get an email telling you what you've won at the auction. If you donate to the auction this year, you will receive an email telling you who won your donation. Please pick up your items in the fellowship hall this week on November 22nd and 23rd between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. The auction committee will be very grateful if you do so. Thank you all for a wonderful auction. I can't wait to see how much we raise. Don't forget, the auction doesn't end until 5 o'clock today. If we bear down, we can do this. Finally, let's not forget how the auction, is, the auction is about more than dollars. It's about heart. When Piglet asked Winnie the Pooh, how do you spell love? Pooh said, you don't spell it, you feel it. Thank you. You lost your tail, Teddy. <laughs> oh, now is the time for us. We share our joys and our sorrows. And we recognize that our personal joys and sorrows are only a fragment of the joys and sorrows of the larger community of life. And thus, we place this first stone, thinking in particular of our country. May we join in thanksgiving for this amazing nation, its founders, and for all who work for, for justice and for America's role in peacemaking and working for a de democratic society where all are given the bounty of its soil and the fruits of our labor. We also remember the five people killed this morning and 18 injured in a shooting at an LGBTQ nightclub in Colorado Springs. And we mourn with those who lost loved ones. And we vow to work towards healing in this country. And now within the congregation, we light a candle of gratitude for Robin and Donna who organized the event on Friday and for all, and I mean all, there were so many volunteers that helped make the night a wonderful success. We couldn't have done it without all of you and it was a wonderful way to reconnect with one another. And if you are staff or volunteers who made our event so special, please Raise your hand. Yeah. And of course, for all the people who aren't here, I mean, I saw folks, I thought we'd have to bring in breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the people who were really trying to code all of the wonderful things that were being sold for the auction. So you're wonderful. So this candle is the light that you gave to all of us. I think it's a birthday girl over there who celebrated a big party last night. <laughs> so I think we have a 70th birthday to celebrate. Woo, woo, woo. And I can't believe you came to set up everything uh, this morning. That's wonderful. So for Julia. And now we place the final stone holding in our hearts the joys and sorrows I've just shared but also thinking of such joys and sorrows among us that are unexpressed, but of no less importance. I invite you now into a moment of silence.
I would now like to welcome members of the Welcoming Congregation Committee to come up and lead us in a Transgender Day of Remembrance ritual. Good morning, my name is Mary Bennett and I am the team leader of the Welcoming Congregation team. Today we are marking Transgender Day of Remembrance. Transgender Day of Remembrance was started on November 20th, 1999 by trans advocate Gwendolyn Ann Smith to honor Rita Hester, a trans woman who was murdered in 1998. It has become an annual day to remember those killed by violence. This year, 375 reported transgender individuals died of violence worldwide, 68 in the United States. We are facing a new epidemic of transphobia intersected with racism, filled with violence, hate, and trans exclusionary legislation, even in our own community. It is important to honor our dead, remember their names, and commit ourselves as individuals and as a faith community to fight for justice, equality, and inclusion. As we read just a few of their names, may we hold them in our hearts. May they rest in power and peace. While we are reading names, the whole list will be scrolled on the screen behind us. Mel Robert Groves died October 13th, 2021 in Jackson, Mississippi of multiple gunshot wounds. Mel was a plant soil scientist at Alcorn State University. Mel loved plants and animals. He shared on his Facebook page, life is a gift and so are chances worth taking. He was an active member of the Knights and Orchids Society, supporting gender justice and LBGTQ plus visibility. He feared for his life in Jackson. Nakai David, 33, died December 3, 2021 in West Oakland. Nakai was shot multiple times on Castro Street in San Francisco, California. Nakai is described by friends as sweet, happy, fun person who was a model and an aspiring social media influencer. Nakai dreamed of opening her own clothing boutique. Kate Yohona Stone, 32, died December 28, 2021, in Indianapolis. She was shot and beaten in a parking lot of a club trying to break up a fight. She was recently hired to work at Trans Solutions Research and Resource Center. Her friends say she provided a safe space in her home for trans people. She was a beloved family member, friend, and strong community activist. Cherry Bush, 48, was shot on July 6, 2022 in Los Angeles by a man making disparaging comments about her perceived gender identity. Cherry was unhoused, living in Salmar neighborhood of the San Fernando Valley. Human Rights Campaign Director Tori Cooper said, Cherry was targeted, shot, and killed simply for existing. ACD. Not sure I'm going to be able to do this. (laughs) 
A.C.D. Morrison, 30, killed August 21st, 2022, in Rapid City, South Dakota. A.C. is described by family and friends as a two-spirited, gender non-conforming. <laughs> it's contagious. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, as a two-spirited, gender, non-conforming person who is always there for family and friends. She was considered a kind-hearted, down-to-earth, respectful, and loving soul. She used laughter as medicine and chose self-love to heal wounds. She opened her home, gave her lasts, and then inspired others to keep with this too shall pass. Brent Wood, 31, killed March 3rd, 2022 in Seattle, Washington, beaten and left behind a dumpster. Brent had no permanent address. Friends say they were an artist and had, had compassion and love for everyone they met. The Capitol Hill small business community said they did odd jobs and sold their art while actively trying to get off the streets. Maddie Hoffman, 47, died May 19th, 2022, in Malvern, Pennsylvania. Maddie was shot three times by police in her own home during a wellness check while she was in a mental health crisis situation. Maddie's wife and two children were present. Maddie's nine-year-old son used to believe that the police were heroes until they killed his mom. The family wishes to elevate the issue so that police and first responders have proper training and support to deal with mental health crises. Serena Brennanman, 16, died September 24th, 2022 of suicide in Salem, Oregon. Serena's friends described her as quirky, kind, stylish, and sweet. Serena's girlfriend said she was soft, elegant, and beautiful. While her family is still trying to come to terms with her gender identity, her choice of name, and the pronoun use of they, them, she, her, they have requested that friends use the name and pronouns she requested. Markeisha Lawrence, killed, um, who is 33, killed November 2021. She was shot to death in her home in Greenville, South Carolina. Markeisha worked as a cook, a residential aide, and a dancer. She studied cosmetology following high school. She loved to cook for friends and family and said it filled her belly and her soul. She was well-loved by family and friends and was said to have a heart of gold and an infectious smile. Asher Garcia died from suicide, 14, died from suicide April 21st, 2022 in Frazee, Minnesota. Asher was a beautifully unique and loving individual. Dealing with past physical abuse and coming to terms with being transgender while experiencing bullying from some middle school peers. His family and friends said Asher cared deeply for others and always looked out for the people he loved. Thank you for that remembrance. <clears throat> the
This is a poem by W.S. Merwin, Thanks. Listen, with the night falling, we are saying thank you. We are stopping on the bridges to bow from the railings. We are running out of the glass rooms with our mouths full of food to look at the sky and say thank you. We are standing by the water, thanking it, standing by the windows, looking out in our directions. Back from a series of hospitals, back from a mugging, after funerals, we are saying thank you. After the news of the dead, whether or not we knew them, we are saying thank you. Over telephones, we are saying thank you. In doorways and in the backs of cars and in elevators, remembering wars and police at the door and the beatings on stairs, we are saying thank you. In the banks, we are saying thank you. And the faces of the officials and the rich and of all who will never change, we go on saying thank you, thank you with all of the animals dying around us, taking our feelings, we are saying thank you. With the forest falling faster than the minutes of our lives, we are saying thank you. With the words going out like cells of a brain, with the cities growing over us, we are saying thank you, faster and faster, with nobody listening, we are saying thank you. Thank you, we are saying and waving, dark though it is. Sing with me. 
my life flows on in endless song above earth's lamentations I hear the Thank you for that blessing. I once worked in New York at an alternative community-based high school. I had many students who were immigrants, and some of the teachers were also immigrants. Some were fleeing from other countries in order to save their lives, and our Spanish teacher had once been stuffed into the trunk of a car to escape from El Salvador. And when these young immigrants got to America, they were all determined to become good citizens. And one external symbol of this was the celebration of America. The Fourth of July and Thanksgiving were days to rejoice because these young citizens, or want to be citizens, celebrated their amazing good fortune, and often with wonderful food and dancing, and often in the streets. And families would bring various ethnic dishes and celebrate, to give me to celebrate my own family dinner. But all of the students and the faculty were determined to have turkey and cranberry on Thanksgiving Day. Why? because this was a symbol of belonging. And living for a time in Queens, one of the most, Queens, New York, one of the most ethnically diverse communities in the world, it felt like this was the center of the universe on Thanksgiving Day, because there was so much authentic gratitude. The sadness or the challenges of leaving their former countries and all of the oppression that they had experienced, it was forgotten on one grand Thanksgiving. Yet, Thanksgiving has not always been great rejoicing. I offer a wee history of the day called Thanksgiving so that all of us can remember that, at times, perseverance and courage pay off. It has not been an easy, straight line to celebrate this day. An author, Melanie Kirkpatrick, documents the winding political and religious paths that both worked for and against the national holiday that we have created called Thanksgiving. And most of the story gives focus to the arrival of the pilgrims in Plymouth, Massachusetts. But in reality, there is much debate about the celebration in Plymouth. Currently, the geographical area that celebrates the landing of the Mayflower is a place where we should both celebrate and mourn at the same time. And some of my, most of my family is moving to Plymouth during this month, and they're checking it all out. And they've been messaging me about what Plymouth is doing to celebrate this day. And local museums are giving much more information on the destruction of the tribes that were colonized by the Europeans. And disease and oppression are part of our Thanksgiving story as colonizers brought death to many of the indigenous peoples who lived in America 20,000 years before the Europeans arrived. 
the Wampanoag tribe lived around Plymouth for 10,000 years. And many of the tribes had their own beautiful harvest festivals. A contemporary Plymouth account states, we native people have no reason to celebrate the arrival of the pilgrims, says Kisha James, a member of the Awina uh, Wamagog Ogala Lakota tribes. We want to educate people about the first Thanksgiving, because Wampanoag and other indigenous people have certainly not lived happily ever after since the arrival of the pilgrims, James says. To us, Thanksgiving is a day of mourning because we remember the millions of our ancestors who were murdered by uninvited European colonists, such as pilgrims. Today, we and many indigenous people around the world say no thanks, no giving. And Brian Whedon, chairman of the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribal Council said on Boston Public Radio that Americans owe his tribe a great deal of gratitude for helping the pilgrims survive their first brutal wind winter. People need to understand that you need to be thankful each and every day. That was how our ancestors thought and navigated this world, Whedon said, because we were thankful, we were willing to share, and we had good intentions and we had a good heart. That wasn't reciprocated over the long term, Whedon added. That's why 400 years later, we're still sitting here fighting for what little bit of land that we still have and trying to hold the Commonwealth and the federal government accountable. It is important for everyone to be thankful for our ancestors who helped the pilgrims survive and kind of played an intricate role in the birth of this nation. This will be the 53rd year that the United Indian Tribes of New England gather on Thanksgiving Day to remind us of a different story, that of the indigenous community. And the reality is that Native people were forced to endure unthinkable violence and oppression by the settlers. And what about the other half of the story, the pilgrims? Not an easy one either. Remember that pilgrims were running from Europe so that they could believe what their own hearts led them to believe and to live. They risked everything. Only 53 pilgrims survived the first year. There were only 22 men, four women, five teenage girls, nine teenage boys, and 13 small children and infants. I can't imagine how many women did I say cooking that first Thanksgiving meal for women. Two to three people died each day for the first few months after the pilgrim's arrival. And the surviving small group was joined by 90 native men. 90 native men. How many women? <laughs> this was a big harvest dinner, folks. And it was recorded to have lasted for three days. And the pilgrims and the indigenous community were dancing between two different cultures and perspectives as they shared these days together. And they were celebrating traditions that had already taken root in America before the colonists arrived. And there may have been, at the very beginning, an opening or a window where a chosen trust could have started a whole new America. But it did not last. Alas, we did not walk down that path. So what is Thanksgiving Day? Why do we celebrate it? A dance between giving and receiving? A dance when two cultures join for a, a brief moment of promise and time? When the documents for them that time stated that both sides, the Puritans, and the Wapanoag's people brought, both brought food to the table. And the Wapanoag actually brought more. Did the Puritans thank the indigenous community for saving their lives? There's no indication of that. And for teaching them the agricultural means of production? Well, here's the thing. They stayed for three days, so something happened there, right? It's not documented, but something happened. But that's not what the myths tell us. 
The local American Indian stories also recall that the pilgrims celebrated the first harvest by, believe it or not, firing guns and cannons in Plymouth. That must have been terrifying to the Wapanog people who did not have armaments. They did not have armaments. What did that feel like? And how can equality ever emerge with such odds at the very beginning? We at QUF have roots in indigenous communities who lost ownership of tribal identity and land, and so we dance lightly on Thanksgiving. And hopefully, we can find sources of joy and ways of giving and receiving thanks. But through the long arch of history, we must remember how much was taken and how little was given in return to the original owners of the land. And the first poem that we read this morning is difficult to practice in daily living, to give thanks in the times of plenty and in the times of famine, to give thanks when we are feeling anything but thankful, to give thanks when the animals are dying, to give that poem. It's fairly raw. And not to get caught up in the political phrase of the moment, but to stay the course. Merwin says we are saying thank you faster and faster with nobody listening. We are saying thank you, thank you, we are saying, and waving through the dark, though it is. Thank you, thank you. It is beyond Plymouth that the Thanksgiving myth took place. Our country had a very difficult time even affirming a day of national thanks. When the day was originally brought forth during our first federal Congress, President Washington was in favor of a Thanksgiving Day, but nothing, nothing comes easily in politics. Two members of the opposing party tried to squelch the idea because they questioned, why should the president direct to do what, perhaps, when they have no mind to? They already are questioning Washington. The argument of states' rights versus federal rights was alive and well, over all things, it started on how do we create a Thanksgiving day. It's beyond comprehension. If we, gave, if we give Washington power to do this, would he take over more things? A Thanksgiving day, what's the next day he's going to proclaim? I don't know. Washington, what, National Shoe Shining Day? Who knows, you know? What? happens when we give someone power? That was the question, and where would it end? This will spread st straight through our political history. The South is late to accept the concept of a federal holiday, and believe it or not, President Thomas Jefferson did not consider himself authorized to give a Thanksgiving proclamation. He was playing it in the middle. He was playing it cool. And this awkward dance would continue throughout our history. Freedom of religion, freedom from proclamation, and ultimately, who is the owner of our country? In 1844, the nasty stain of what we today call Christian nationalism was alive. The governor of South Carolina stated that Thanksgiving was for those who lived in a Christian land. And when pushed, he stated Thanksgiving was an American day, and it did not occur to me that there might be Israelites, deists, atheists, or any other class of persons in the state who would deny the divinity of Jesus Christ. And I have no apology to make for that. Happy Thanksgiving. And with the pushback against such blatant bigotry, Thanksgiving was thankfully growing in a different direction. Abraham Lincoln, da-da, during the Civil War, claimed the day for both the Unionists and the Confederates. Can I say that again? It's the middle of the war, and he says this day is for both sides. Yes, it's an idealized concept of the holiday, he says, the year that is drawing towards its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. 
that's the opening of his proclamation. This was 1863, the year of the Battle of Gettysburg, the year that the Union lost 27% of its fighting men, the year that the Confederacy lost 37%. It is simply amazing to me that Lincoln had the chutzpah to call the whole nation to a moment of thanksgiving rather than lamentation. He said that the day was one to pull us toward an increase of freedom. He was speaking of renewal, not anger. Renewal during one of the worst moments of American history with a country split and with divided values. What a president to see that. Thanksgiving is going to be the thing that unites us. And every president after him has taken his lead by giving a Thanksgiving proclamation. What are our blessings despite horrible odds? And like many social movements, this one was taken on by a woman, Sarah Josepha Hall. She was an amazing woman, and her credentials are awe-inspiring. She's one of the women who founded Vassar College and was the editor of Godey's Ladies Book, and the most, this was the most influential periodical before the Civil War. Shirley Lincoln and the wives of many influential men began to hear about Thanksgiving from a different vantage point because of her influence. She wanted a holiday for all, and she wanted it as a day of healing. Of healing. Perhaps wives push their husbands to think of Thanksgiving as a holiday for the rich, the poor, immigrants, and also for those who descended from the original folks of the Mayflower. The concept of Thanksgiving began to be seen as a holiday of the whole nation, albeit little was said about Native rights. It was a, to, it was a holiday where we stop and see our unity and not our divisions. And think of your own Thanksgiving tables. Surely, not everyone totes the same politics, the same religious beliefs, or perhaps the same food. My family has the vegan table and the carnivore table. And we do mix and mingle, but we stick up our noses. <laughs> Hale worked most of her life to get the sanctions of Congress to make Thanksgiving our American holiday, but the country would have to wait until 1941 the states could not agree on what day it should be celebrated. So, if you were in Oregon, it would be one day in New York, and another. could you believe this? And so, finally, Congress agreed, and President Roosevelt signed the resolution on December 26, 1941, establishing the fourth Thursday in November as the federal Thanksgiving Day holiday. This is one heck of a journey to get here, isn't it? And each U.S. president has added to the story with a Thanksgiving proclamation based on the one first given by Washington. President Reagan was the first president to mention Native Americans and their ancient traditions of giving thanks. Obama stated in 2011 that the Wampanoag need to be thanked for generously extending their knowledge of local game and agriculture to the pilgrims. He urged Americas to take this time to remember the first Americans who have enriched our nation's heritage. The circle took that long, 400 years, to make the circle back. Thank you, Obama. Thank you, Reagan. Two different sides came together to make this feast for us. And so when I look at the rich history of Thanksgiving, it is one of push and pull, and our holiday is not totally a love trip on a sleigh to grandmother's house. Although, in my case, it was. <laughs> the history of Thanksgiving intertwines with our own history. This story does not belong to the politicians. It is the people who rescued the concept of Thanksgiving over and over and over again. 
The people kept the day, even when the politicians argued over its existence, because hope and thanksgiving are what really carry us through the worst and the best of times. We can't, we can't have thanksgiving unless we have hope. We can't have hope unless we have thanksgiving. Thanksgiving must be for more than one day or for one season. It is a choice to clothe ourselves with thanks. We humans can't carry despair, anger, or dismissal of another along with a thankful heart. It's impossible. They can't coexist in the same space. How does one wage war or live in egotistical isolation with a spirit of thankfulness? Can you think of a way to do that? Our country has been dealing with this. How can we live in a selfish state and, not, and, and be thankful? So, each of us has to choose to live with, with thanksgiving and to learn how to dance on the edges, right? Not every Thanksgiving day, at least in my family, was one of great joy. <laughs> Sometimes... We even stood on tables. We were pretty political. <laughs> but it was dancing together and loving one another. So, wake up in the morning, no matter what time the alarm rings, close your eyes with thankfulness. My late husband and I, before we slept, stated one thing from the past day for which we were thankful, but we made this rule. It could not be a thing, and it could not be a possession. Uh-uh. So sometimes it would have, it was always an interaction. And sometimes it was just, I had this great interaction with a raindrop. Really? What happened? You know, it was on that level of what is it that one sees? not wants. What is it that's given, that's unexpected? And when we told our stories, we turned out the lights. Thanksgiving is America with its highest ideals. And if we do not live up to what we say and believe on Thanksgiving Day, then we need to seek forgiveness and reparation. And we need to break the original myth of how the Wampanoag and pilgrims celebrated a love feast. Uh-uh. The virtue of thanksgiving only lives in the truth. Imagine this. If we as a community, as an American community, had continued to share presence with the Wampanoag tribe every day over the last 400 years. <laughs> imagine what stories we would talk about over the Thanksgiving table and imagine the tremendous diversity of folks at the table. Meister Eckhart, a medieval scholar, stated that the only thing that is required of us in this life is to say two words. The only thing we have to do in our whole life, you know what those two words are. Thank you. That is enough for our lifetime. So I ask you just to take a moment and open your hands and say, what am I thankful for this year that is not a thing, that is not a commodity, that is not something that I want to own? Just kind of think about it and see if you can hold it in your hand. Maybe you can't hold it in your hand, but you can try. have it, I'd ask you to do this. Turn to someone, pray me somebody you don't know. Offer them your gift. Receive theirs. And there's only two words that you can say to each other. Give you a minute. Hear what I'm saying? Just turn. Can you offer this gift to someone?
When I am grateful, I am neither rushing nor slouching through my day. I'm dancing. Our closing song is hymn 326, Let All the Beauty We Have Known. Please stand as you are able and willing. Join us in our chalice extinguishing words. We extinguish our flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, the fire of commitment, or the power of transformation. These we carry in our hearts until the hell. Next week, Victoria Poling will be speaking on the topic Answering the Call. Becoming UU Ministers. We hope you can join us. Our postlude today features pianist Shelley Brown playing Tim's stories in the small spot with imagery by Ida. <laughs>